Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've been interested in minimal surfaces and their moduli spaces and the boundary of that moduli space for a while. I'm going to expose you to some of um, the mysteries of this, this subject by um, showing you what are called balance equations for minimal surfaces. This is a discovery made by Martin Trezé maybe 10 years ago now. And he used this to study a construction method for minimal surfaces. And if you go back 10 more years in time, then um, it became fashionable to take a known minimal surface and add a handle to it. And uh, this has become an industry, sorts of. But the disadvantage of this is that it got harder and harder and harder. So adding one handle gets your genus one surface, but if you start with a sphere, then your genus two, and things became complicated. But Martin Trezé developed a method that is quite elegant and uh, led always, or leads always to a system of equations which are called balanced equations. And they are still not completely understood how they work, and I'd like, you, I'd like to show you some of these. But let's start off really easily with um, uh, classical surfaces. Here's a picture of the catenoid. What you see on the top left are uh, so-called Weierstrass data, and I'll come to these. And this is how you would see the catenoid still looks a little distorted to me, but that will be fine. How you would see the catenoid typically in a, in a book or so. But for the purpose of this talk, I would like you to pretend that the catenoid is much, much, much bigger and you're very, very far away. What you would see then truly are almost two just horizontal planes very close to each other joined by a tiny, tiny neck. So that's how the catenoid would look from very far away. That's more like the typical picture of which we study, but uh, for the purpose of the talk, a catenoid can also, the same catenoid from far away looks just two planes, almost parallel, and a catenoidal neck between these. Second surface you all have seen is the helicoid, again with its so-called Weierstrass representation. That's how it typically looks like. But again, for the purpose of the talk, I would like to think you of the surface as being much, much, much bigger. So then what you would see are layers of horizontal planes very, very close to each other. And then there's a vertical line, which is still the vertical axis of the helicoid, that goes through everything, so you get what is now called a lamination of R3, or a foliation of R3 by horizontal planes with one singular line vertically through it. You can also think about such a helicoid from far away as kind of a parking garage, where you can go in and drive around, get higher and higher and higher, and then find a parking space and drive out again later on. So we'll come to structures that are related to these parking garages a little later too. Okay, so these are the basic minimal surfaces, the two oldest minimal surfaces besides the plane, and um, they're still the most important ones, I would say, and they will serve us as building blocks to construct minimal surfaces. Now, um, also for the purpose of just this talk, I'd just like to discuss a toy example, and um, the toy is to the top right there, that's a mineral surface that's not particularly interesting. So it doesn't appear in the literature anywhere, and uh, it has the drawback, it's not embedded, you should think about it as being a horizontal plane, like this, and then you stick catenoidal necks up, out, to the bottom, up, bottom, up, bottom, up, bottom, up, bottom, up, and so on periodically. So it's a translation invariant minimal surface with infinitely many ends, and the quotient, it will topologically just be a sphere, annulus, with um, two annular ends to the right and to the left, which come from the plane I marked like this. And then in, in the quotient, again, it has one catenoidal end sticking up, one sticking down. So it's really not very interesting because that surface is not embedded, and it's very simple. It just has genus zero in the quotient. But still, you can now ask questions about it. Can you create a um, more complicated examples like this. Just to study, say, moduli problems, to get your, your, your muscles a little warm for more complicated examples. What are the possibilities for such a surface as this one, where you have this plane, it will eventually be periodic, but you might want to put the catenoidal neck somewhere else. So what are the options? Where can you put the catenoidal necks? That's a typical question I uh, give my, my students if they want to learn about minimal surfaces, that's a typical toy problem they should uh, learn about. So uh, let's see what we can do here. 
we do a little bit of a setup. We fix what are called configuration spaces. So instead of making complicated drawings, we'll just denote a surface we might want to construct like this. The plus sign indicates we want a catenoidal neck going up. So the whole, the whole screen now is the plane. And we want a surface that's periodic this way. Catenoidal neck means, the plus sign means catenoidal neck coming up. The minus signs will be catenoidal necks going into the wall and everything will be periodic. Can we make something like that? And if so, where precisely do we have to put the catenoidal necks? So that's the type of question I would like you to think about as a warm-up question. And here's how you do it. Uh, there's a pretty simple procedure. You can do this using the wire stress data. If you first you set up what are called plausible wire stress data. This is a Riemann surface that underlies everything. Now I already told you this is going to be just a punctured sphere. We have the punctures represent the, the two annular ends and the many, many catenoidal ends I'm probably going to have. Then you have to make sure that you write down the, uh, the Weierstrass data Gauss map and the height differential for the Weierstrass data. So there's a certain formula that does that, namely this one here that involves the Gauss map, capital G, and it involves the height differential, the H at the end. And uh, this is a local formula in the sense that every minimal surface can be given this way with a meromorphic function G and a holomorphic one form DH. But you have to integrate. And the integration process might cause trouble because uh, that's a real part missing in front of the integral sign, as I just noticed. If you go around a puncture representing one of the SNs, the curve in space you get this way might not close up. That is called the period problem. So that means to ensure that all curves on the sphere map to closed curves in space, you have to solve a bunch of equations. And uh, so they, you write down the so-called period problem, and then you solve for the parameters, which are the locations of the points. So it's essentially a pretty straightforward process to construct the surfaces I have outlined. Let's see what this leads to. If you do this for the case at hand, punctures, we have to normalize things. So I told you the surface we are looking at as a quotient of genus zero, a sphere, that is conformally just the complex plane that's punctured, well, at infinity, this is one puncture, at zero is another puncture. Let's let that these two punctures correspond to the two annular ends, this one and that one of the surface. And then there are many other punctures which we just might call PI. Here, these guys here, these are points where we want our catenoidal ends sticking out or sticking down. And if you set that up, the, the data given, now just the placement of the PIs, these are the locations of the plus and minus signs. So where do we have to put these? To figure that out, we need to write down the Gauss map. And if you think about the Gauss map, this is for a minimal surface, just a stereographic projection of a normal map. And at the catenoidal next, the Gauss map is always vertical. Gauss map points at its effect always infinity. So uh, if we normalize this to be infinity, then we need a pole for the Gauss map, which is to be holomorphic. So the Gauss map has to be of that form here. And the height differential needs to compensate that. So you can easily figure out, as a standard exercise in a little bit of complex analysis, what Gauss map and height differential got to be. And there are certain parameters, aj here, in addition to the punctures, pj. And they determine, essentially, how fat the catenoids are, or more precisely, what the neck sizes of the catenoids are. And they could be smaller or thinner. So these are additional parameters. And uh, with these data, you go back to this Weierstrass representation and compute what the periods around all these necks are, because you want to make sure that these periods actually vanish. And the vanishing of these periods gives you equations. And uh, when you write these equations down, you get these equations here. These are the so-called balance equations. Let's think about these. The AJs, I told you, are the next sizes of the catenoids. And they can be positive or negative. And uh, so you have uh, a sum of these, these quantities here. And you get lots of equations like this. For each catenoidal neck at position PK, on the left-hand side, you get one equation that says the quotient AK over PK needs to be somehow balanced using as terms all the other quantities coming from the other catenoids. So there are some electromagnetic, electrostatic forces going on between the catenoidal necks. They repel, and uh, because you have these in the denominator like this, and there are different signs, though, so there's also attraction cause. It's a little tricky what is precisely going on here. 
But that's the idea. You get all these equations, and now the next thing you do is you try to solve these equations, right? And then uh, you, of course, go to the very first case we have looked at. For instance, we can look at our toy example. This was the very simple picture I had at the beginning. You have just this plane, catenoidal neck, up, down, up, down, up, down, like this. We could parameterize that, for instance, by using P1 being plus 1 and P2 being minus 1. The neck sizes being the same up to sine. And if you plug that in, you see, OK, the equations are solved. So that's indeed a minimal surface, what I've shown you. So that would be pretty easy and pretty straightforward. And after that success, you try to find the other example I've shown you with the many plus and minus signs there and try to make something like that. Turns out this also works. And then a little bit of a mystery starts evolving. So you try a setup like this. You put a catenoidal neck up like this. You go a step further, put two catenoidal necks down like this, somewhere here. Then you do this periodically, one neck up, two necks down. One neck up, two necks down, and so on, okay? So that would be one possible surface you can construct this way. You go to the equations I've shown you and solve these. With three variables, that's still fine. And you can do that explicitly. And you come up with solutions. Then you do the same game with more catenoidal necks. You just got a new surface, right? So you try to get another one. One catenoidal neck up, three catenoidal necks here. One up, three here. One up, three there, and so on. So you get another set of equations and four variables now. You solve these and, OK, you find a solution. And the solutions get more and more intricate. They're still algebraic numbers because these are systems of algebraic equations. But you start wondering about these. And then um, you have this idea to form a polynomial whose roots are just the solutions you found. And then you expand this and you realize, OK, these nasty algebraic numbers disappear. And you get a polynomial that looks like this. So it's all, this, these are the binomial coefficients there. So these are pretty simple polynomials. And uh, you denote for, for each n, for each number of catenoidal necks that go down in a row, you get one new polynomial. And you solve for the roots of this polynomial. And the roots you get give you exactly the solutions to these balance equations. So this means that polynomial essentially determines, if you solve for its, its roots, where on this line are the catenoidal necks place that go down. And that works for each n. This means you can construct one of these toy examples with 100 catenoids going down here, one catenoid going up here, 100 going down there, and periodically, and so on, by just taking the polynomial there with p100, solving for its roots. And there are 100 distinct real roots of it. And they will give you the data where these things have to be placed. That's a neat observation, but again, this is just a toy example, right? So there's not, nothing that interesting going on. But it's a little mysterious that just one simple polynomial should determine all this. So why is that the case? This is, has a very simple explanation. And then because uh, I still have apparently time, nothing has beeped yet, I can um, give you even the proof of that. So the key observation is that the polynomials I gave you satisfy a hyperbolic differential equation. So they are among the special polynomials that provide solutions to polynomial solutions to the hyperbolic differential equation. And the particular case at hand, it's that one or up above there. So you see you have the polynomial, derivative of it, second derivative of it, and then there are factors that are linear or quadratic in the variable z. That's ingredient number one. And that's already a quite important observation that these mysterious polynomials I wrote down satisfy a common hypergeometric ODE. Secondly, very general elementary calculus fact, if you have a polynomial with simple roots placed at p1 to pn, then the second derivative over the first derivative divided by 2 at the pi is just the right-hand side of my balance equations. Right? If you, if you use your visual memory to remember the right expression at the bottom. If we go back a little bit, here it is, except there are eight j's instead of a, a, a one. But the case I'm talking about, which I forgot to mention, I think, is that all the catenoidal necks that go down should have the same neck sizes. Otherwise, things get more complicated. So the right-hand side is exactly this. And if you put these two facts together, you can, using the differential equation, evaluate the differential equation at the roots of p. First term disappears, and you just get a 
and the relation between P and double prime and P and prime. So you can universally evaluate this term here for our uh, polynomials Pn at any of the roots and get a universal expression, which then becomes the left-hand side of, or the, the other side of the balance equation. So these two things can be used to easily prove what I've claimed so far. So in, this was a very brief, complete discussion, if you like, of the toy example. This constructs all kinds of interesting or not so interesting minimal surfaces with arbitrarily many catenoidal necks. Now again, the interesting part about these surfaces is not so much that these surfaces uh, are minimal surfaces and are not embedded and so on. The interesting part is that these equations are kind of surprising. So yet the period conditions have surprisingly simple and elegant solutions. Now, if that was too successful, let's uh, go one step further. So you can also try to build something like this. Two catenoidal necks sticking up, three catenoidal necks sticking down. Two up, three down, two up, three down. Um, you can, in fact, but you don't really want to because if you play the same game and let Mathematica solve the equations for you, it eventually will come up with something like this. I have a slightly different normalizations. Here, in this case, I've put the ends of the surface at plus one and minus one instead of at zero infinity. Otherwise, the solutions here wouldn't have fit on a single slide. So I made this normalization to make it a little easier. One of the punctures is then at infinity, and the other punctures are there. And these are fairly complicated algebraic numbers, and they are not all roots of the same polynomial anymore. Only the last two happen to be roots of a polynomial of degree eight. And uh, the other roots don't show up. So the pattern we've seen for the simple case, one up and down, one up and down, doesn't generalize to more complicated situations. And uh, it's a complete mystery to me how the other more complicated cases, like two up, three down, and so on, how they relate to this at all. Let's go to make this interesting. So far, we have only discussed the toy example, and I would like to step this up a little bit to create actually what Trezé cooked his method up for, namely embedded minimal surfaces in Euclidean space. What Trezé does is he says, okay, we would, like not, we would like to construct such minimal surfaces, but maybe only near where they degenerate to certain limits. And the simplest possible limit they can degenerate to are those where they develop what are called nodes. So this means curves are being pinched, like all these curves here are pinched. We see a genus three surface on the board here, and essentially all necks that can be pinched for the surface are being pinched so that we develop a noded Riemann surface that has, uh, whose components are just topologically spheres, or conformally spheres. So punctured spheres at finitely many points. So if you decompose these here, then uh, you get uh, just spheres with punctures. So that's the concept of a noted Riemann surface. And Trezé's idea was to say, okay, let's try to construct, say, a one-parameter family of minimal surfaces that uh, converge conformally, the conformal structure, the underlying Riemann surfaces converge to noted spheres. Let's also assume that the wire does data the homomorphic Gauss map and the height differential somehow make sense on the noted spheres. So that we are even able to write down the period condition of the noted spheres. Then we might get really lucky because on a general Riemann surface, if somebody hands me a holomorphic or meromorphic one form, I have a hard time computing periods to figure out whether curves of my minimal surface will still be closed in space or not. But on a Conformal, conformal punctured sphere, I can easily do that because, uh, or typically easily do that, because on a sphere, all meromorphic data are in fact rational, and the, all integrals that can possibly occur, curves are just curves around punctures. So all integrals can be evaluated using the residue theorem. So everything that becomes problematic on a highly transcendental Riemann surface becomes purely algebraic on the underlying, on the, on a, on a Riemann surface that's just a punctured sphere. So that was Trezé, one part of Trezé's idea. He wanted only construct minimal surfaces that converge to noted Riemann surfaces that decompose into components that are punctured spheres. Um, then, so I've said essentially everything that's on this slide, periods can be evaluated explicitly. 
then the equations you get on these noted spheres in the limiting situation would again be some set of these balance equations. So the question is, what kind of equations do you get? Can you solve these equations, as I showed you in the toy example? And if yes, there needs to be an additional step, because at this point, we are just computing things on some limit object, which typically doesn't give us anything interesting in, in space. So we need one regeneration step. We need to use the implicit function theorem to regenerate from the degenerate limit to actual surfaces nearby that limit in space. And that's what Trezé achieved in a few cases. Here is the first case where Trezé, for, for which Trezé invented his method. On the left-hand side, you see Riemann's minimal surface, very famous minimal surface, lots of horizontal planes joined by catenoidal necks. That's one way to think about it. The most astounding feature of the surface is that if you slice it horizontally by planes, you just get circles. This is a pretty, pretty stunning discovery of Riemann. And um, pushing way in the early 90s produced this image here to the right. It's actually his picture. And it's a historical image, a very early picture of it. There are not many others of it, though. And uh, he wrote down the wire stress data for the surface, but he never proved that it existed. So it would be the same kind of surface as Riemann surface, except that uh, the handle at each other layer has been broken apart into two handles. So it's a genus two Riemann minimal surface, if you like, or genus three, if you look at it at the quotient. And um, that took a while until many people have thought about it to actually prove that something like that existed. And Trezé not only proved that this particular surface exists, but many, many others do. So what he did is he did exactly what I said. He studied what happens if you let this surface degenerate. Riemann surface comes in a family of minimal surfaces. And you have two choices for the one parameter family parameter. You can, in both cases, the planes get closer to each other. And in one case, you just get really caten horizontal planes joined by catenoidal necks. Catenoidal neck here, catenoidal neck there, catenoidal neck there, and so on. So it gets kind of a staircase. The other limit is more complicated there you would get, in fact, two helicoids in the limit. And I don't have a picture right now showing. You can kind of see the two helicoids forming a little bit here to the right and to the left of this picture. So there are these two limits. And Trezé rightly thought that catenoids are a little bit simpler to visualize than catenoids. So he thought, what happens when uh, you look at this family and try to conceive a limit of this family? And his idea was what you should get is two catenoidal necks sticking down one catenoidal neck here. The next layer, two catenoidal necks, one catenoidal, two catenoids, and so on. So similar pattern as we just had before here, except that now we are not just having catenoids going up and down, but just catenoidal necks connecting layers. Then Trezé said, OK, let's suppose we can move to the limit somehow, to the limit object. What do we get? We would get planes, which are just punctured spheres, where on in each plane we have three additional nodes, one down, two up, or two down, one up, connecting these nodes. So he went on to evaluate the Weierstrass data in the limit, solved the equations, and he found something that I had observed when I was, was visiting uh, Jim Hoffman at MSRI, who had helped making this picture, and I was interested in the same problem at that time, curiously enough, so I had asked Jim, Hmm, can we maybe use the program that draws this image to see how this looks close to the limit? And we pushed the parameters a little bit and tweaked the program. And then I took out a ruler and measured the position of these three necks that form on a screen when looked from the top. And because it looked pretty much like they were at the positions of an equilateral triangle. And um, at, from, from the computation, it looked really pretty close. And, uh, I looked at uh, Jim and said, OK, if somebody can prove that this is really an equilateral triangle, it would be big progress. And a few weeks later, I got uh, Martin Trezé's preprint where he actually showed that. And the first thing I did is when I saw his equations, I checked that really these points are at the positions of an equilateral triangle, which is what he predicted. But he predicted much more. Instead of just doing this one example, he did what I did with the toy example. One catenoidal neck down n catenoidal necks in a row. So not just two, but n of them in a row lining up. One down, n in a row, one down, n in a row, and so on. So he looked at that example too, and he wrote down the equations for it. And the funny thing is, he again gets 
when he takes the numbers he gets as the solutions for these equations, puts them as roots of a polynomial, these polynomials become classically well-known polynomials, namely Chebyshev polynomials, which also solve a second order o hypergeometric ODE. So that was a pretty surprising case. And uh, again, there are other exotic examples, like 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, which <coughs> do not satisfy such a simple picture. And they are more mysterious even. And we don't understand anything about those. Well, Trezé and me got talking, and uh, Mike Wolf and uh, David Hoff and myself had been working on the genus 1 helicoid for a while, which is a, a surface that adds a handle to the helicoid and the classical set setting where you want to add a handle to a single surface. And uh, Trezé said, OK, these come in a one parameter family, right? These are actually screw motion and variant minimal surfaces where you have periodically handles added to the helicoid, and you can untwist these, and the handles then disappear to infinity except one, and you get the genus one helicoid out of this. I said, yeah, that's right. What happens when you twist down the other way? Do the handles get closer to each other, or what happens? So what we figured out by looking again at very old software Fu Sheng Wei wrote was that something else happens. Namely, and this is very hard to visualize, we would get as the limit of the screw motion and variant genus one helicoids, we would get one helicoid here, another helicoid there, and a third helicoid there. So we have a, something like a really complicated parking garage. I bet they exist, but I haven't really, I mean, typically you see these two column garages, but there's also a possibility of the three column garage. When you go around one column this way, say counterclockwise, you go up. In the middle column, you go around a counterclockwise, you go down again, and the other outer column, you go up. So you take three helicoids, like here, that are kind of merged together into a single helicoid with but three separate axes, though. So that's another parking garage structure. And that is kind of the picture you get when you rescale the genus one helicoid vertically close to its other limit, so to speak. So that's not a minimal surface we see here. That's what you get by taking the limit of the genus one helicoid, and while you approach the limit, you vertically rescale it. If you don't vertically rescale it, you just get a horizontal foliation by planes, and you don't see anything anymore. But when you vertically rescale it, you get something you can actually write down explicitly. That was pretty neat. So we, we thought maybe we can actually understand these limits by instead of gluing catenoids together, we glue helicoids together, the other elementary particles for, for minimal surfaces. It turned out it works. You can do it with a 3-2 configuration like this. This would correspond to a limit of a hypothetical genus 2 helicoid screw motion family, of which we could only prove a little part of its existence, maybe close to that kind of limit. That there, in fact, is another limit of this family is still open and very much questioned. And we could push just further, further, further to any number. And the fun thing is that the positions of the axis of the parking garage axis, they are arranged, again, line up nicely on the real axis and are placed at the roots of amide polynomials, which are, again, special polynomials that satisfy a hypergeometric ODE. Did anything beep yet? 12 minutes left. Excellent. OK, we are at amide polynomials now. Next point in the story is, um, well, I went to Indiana, and uh, I got tenure, and I acquired students, so they had to work on things too. So in one thing, they, I had them, a, a student of mine who's also talking about this, actually, he later on here now, uh, Peter Connor, uh, was working on is the following question. You can look at doubly periodic minimal surfaces, like the ones over here. There are essentially two different types of doubly periodic minimal surfaces. The ones that are in the textbooks are typically just the shirk surfaces that have half planar or shirk annular ends going down and orthogonal to them going ends going up. Or sometimes they make an angle. And we'll have Mike Wolf talk about their relatives later on too. Now these guys are of a totally different nature. They come with half planar or annular ends going down and up. So all ends are parallel to each other. And uh, this was the, to the left, you see the first examples that we have found by Karscher and uh, Meeks and Rosenberg independently around uh, 1993, I think. And uh, you can just think about these as being planes 
stuck together again using catenoidal necks. Uh, Fu Sheng Wei again uh, said, okay, we can make these more complicated. We can add a handle to this, but these surfaces still look a little bit like planes stuck together with, thank you, catenoidal necks. So the question then you can ask, of course, is suppose I give you a bunch of planes and uh, sort of a number of catenoidal necks between these, what are the equations that govern the positions of the catenoidal necks that connect these planes as to make a doubly periodic surface, right? The surface extends to the right, to the left, singly periodically, and also backwards into and outwards towards the screen, and the ends go up and down in both these cases. So what are the possible positions for this? And uh, what happens is something like this. So Connor found uh, these nice examples. You kind of see that uh, the size of the necks has to balance in these cases. So the size of the necks that are coming toward you, the neck size has to be the sum of the neck sizes going away from you. And uh, that's just because of the residue theorem. And then you see, okay, there should be some rule that places these tiny necks somehow on this, this line here. And here's the same picture. Yes, here's another picture of the 2 3 configuration, which uh, I discussed briefly in the case of the toy example. And you can already guess the answer, right? So the answer will be yeah, there must be, if you write down the real numbers where these necks are placed in the limit, there will be then some polynomial that does the job. And in fact, uh, these are the Legendre polynomials that control the situation. And again, they satisfy a second order hypergeometric ODE. So for me, this is a pretty big mystery that um, these now truly important minimal surfaces, except my toy example, which is not important, they all satisfy equations that can be solved by classical polynomials. And there is no reason why that should be the case. And I'll come to some open problems in a few minutes that are related to this, but I think this is, uh, is maybe one of the most exciting mysteries in the theory of the Weierstrass representation that we, we currently have. I mean, there are many exciting things going on for minimal surfaces, but if it comes to the Weierstrass representation, from my point of view, this is maybe the most mysterious and most interesting part right now. Why do second order ODEs play such a role to solve these equations? Why do these solutions exist at all that simply? Another approach you can try, and a student of mine is currently doing it, you will hear from him in your um, application folders in the fall, Kevin Lee, he is studying how to glue bent planes together. So you have a plane like this, and then you tilt the ends a little bit upwards or downwards and put catenoidal necks between these. The surface you see there is actually a very well-known surface. It was found by uh, Karsha in 1989, maybe, and generalizes Schurk's singly periodic surface. Schurk's classical singly periodic surface just takes two planes, and dissects these, and desingularizes this by putting necks between these. And uh, you can have the same thing with more ends, and Karsha found these and classified what's possible there if you have something with, say, six ends that intersect and you want to desingularize these. And when you make the angle between the ends on one side and the other side pretty small, so three ends go out like this and like that, like in this picture, then there's a simple way to visualize these as in that picture by just joining the different sheets with catenoidal necks. So the same question as usual arises, where can we put the catenoidal necks and can we maybe put others lining them up somewhere else as to get minimal, embedded minimal surfaces that are now singly periodic, but much, much, much more complicated than, um, uh, than Schurk's or Kasha Schurk's examples. And he has written down the equations and there are some solutions already, but there is still some work to be done, so therefore I don't give you any, any more concrete results. And uh, yeah, let's talk last remaining minutes, a little bit about these, the open problems associated to this, because I think there are many open questions besides just the stunning question, why is it that simple? So uh, for instance, let's go back to Riemann's minimal surface, the original surface that triggered all this. Trezé just added more handles to Riemann by looking at one limit of Riemann's surface, which is plane, catenoid, plane, catenoid, plane, catenoid, and place catenoidal necks between that. You can also go to the other limit of the Riemann surface, and that is a harder limit because it 
looks like you join two helicoids together, like Trezé and I did when we looked at the helicoid families. However, in that case, you have one helicoid that has kind of positive spin and the other helicoid has negative spin. So these guys together merge to something that then has planar ends, which is the case for, for the Riemann minimal surface. The question is, therefore, can you look at other constructions with helicoids, like four helicoids in a row, plus, minus, plus, minus spin, and create minimal surface out of these by writing down the equations? Can you possibly even merge catenoidal and helicoidal necks? And numerical evidence suggests that you should, because all these families, Trisé, for instance, considers they are short time families. They exist only for a few milliseconds, so to speak, and then nobody knows what happens to them. That's the next intriguing question. Look at any of the families that are constructed using this regeneration method because we are using the implicit function theorem. We don't know what will happen to them after the implicit function theorem stops working on them, right? So, but the, for instance, we could prove the existence of Riemann's minimal surface just using Trezé's method, and we would only know Riemann exists for a short time. That it then converges to something that decomposes into two helicoids is a, a total surprise from this point of view. So you can instantly ask the question, what happens to all these families after long time, for instance? Then, we have, so far we have only looked at two elementary particles, the simplest one, namely the catenoid and uh, the helicoid. There are other cases that show up, like you can, you have situations where the nodes that develop are more complicated. They form, for instance, Costa-type nodes. Try to write down and analyze balance equations in that situation. Another issue is, which is very important for understanding, for instance, higher genus helicoids, is a uniqueness question. You have these solutions generated by these polynomials. Are there others? If not, then you should be able to prove uniqueness. If yes, what makes the solutions generated by the uh, special polynomial special? So they should be distinguished somehow. And this is both, both these questions are intriguing. So no matter what the answer is, uniqueness or non-uniqueness, there should be interesting answers still. Thank you very much. <laughs>